Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Dave's Gone By. Coming to you not live, not from WGBB tonight, because I am away. I am in, well, God willing, uh, when you are listening to this, I will be in St. Paul, Minnesota, at a conference of the American Theatre Critics Association, hopefully having a blast there, eating a lot of food, seeing a lot of theatre. But uh, I wanted to pre-record a show for you, and unfortunately, I don't know if you've been listening to the radio station the last couple of weeks, but uh, there's been, of course, a lot of uh, turmoil there. So a lot of the pre-production I had wanted to do for tonight's show, June 15th, 2003, wasn't able to, which is a shame because it's Father's Day, and there's stuff I wanted to to talk about with my dad, and um, also... On June 16th, that's my wife's birthday, and I wanted to play a couple of songs and do a few things for her. But, best night plans, that didn't work out. I had to end up jerry-rigging something very quickly at home, as you can hear from uh, this low-quality audio tape. But don't worry, the rest of the show isn't of this uh, bad sound quality. What I've done is I've gone back and found a tape of when I was guesting on a show that's no longer on GBB called Teen America. It was a show that initially started out as a way for teens to talk about issues, dating, and sex, and school, and all that. Kind of a, a view for the teens. And it was good for a while, and then it got kind of silly, and there wasn't uh, that much money or interest put into it, and it fell apart. But uh, towards the end there, they were kind enough to have me on as a guest once or, to- once or twice, even though I'm two decades past my teens. And this particular time... I was there, Engineer Paul was there in the booth, and just one of the Teen America people was, uh, had shown up. So we all did a show together, and it was kind of cool. It was March, so the war had, was already past full swing. We'd already basically won, and we were just talking about it, talking about the situation in Iraq at that point, about the protests going on in New York and across the country against the war. Um... And I think that, that's, that's really all you have to know about it. And as I said, please stick with it, because it's still kind of interesting. Uh, the sound quality is better than what you're hearing now. And also, don't forget to tune in next week on the uh, 22nd of June, because I will be back live in the studio with a brand new episode of Games Gone By. But this, this material has been played on GBB, but never on my show. So it's new stuff. I hope you enjoy it. We'll pick it up as we're talking about the anti-war protests on Team America about three months ago. Well, I read somewhere that um, the, the wisest police work, and especially during the day, is that very seemingly very few police for a whole lot of people and everything gets orderly. The minute you bring in walls of blue, it's, it's considered an impingement and people get really up, I mean, up in arms and, and they hate seeing that and they're like, oh, you know, the hell with you and... and why you wouldn't well, I don't understand what the problem me. is. If, if the whole crowd is penned in where you would park cars on a street, so it's not impeding the sidewalk, and it's not impeding the flow of traffic, and they're penned in there protesting, dancing, doing whatever they're supposed to be doing during a protest, why is it all of a sudden a problem getting them out of there if there's so many people in such a cramped space? I mean, you've seen Times Squares on New Year's. Well, I- yeah. Okay, it takes hours to clean out Times Square. Wouldn't you expect that all these people just can't, like, beam and teleport out of there instantaneously? It's going to take some time to clear it? That's the problem. The police have their orders to disperse, and between the, the image of how long the figures it takes the crowd to disperse, and they how long it really that takes, much quicker. to t- tell that to the people at the Rhode Island nightclub, you know. People were coming out of that room, out of that building. No pro- oh, gee, there's a fire there. I'm going to get out. And then one minute later, people were being stomped to death. Well, this is fun. It's, <laughs> you know what happens? It's, you tell someone to move, and they're half in the bag. They've been drinking because they were at a protest, and they're called. Or not drinking, but their spirits are high. Whatever happened, and you're going to start telling them to move. Their spirits are high because they're protesting other things. The first thing they're going to do is resist the police. Um, if you're telling somebody who all day has been screaming, we don't want war, we don't want war, we don't want this, we're going to defy, and then someone says, listen, buddy, your permit's up, you got to get out of the streets, it's causing trouble. People, they want you to get there. And then they're going to... You know, get out quick. Yeah, and they're going to resist right back to the cops. So it's almost like asking for it. So. There's a, there's a, that's kind of a good point. I mean, there's a, a boiling point on both sides. The cops went out there right. trying to be perfect it's the whole day. Yeah. 
And then, you know, you, you get a little, they get a little ragged after a while. Yeah, but how many lawsuits has San Francisco got for police brutality now in the past this year? Frisco, Los Angeles. I mean, Los Angeles is known for... Frisco. Really? Frisco. You have no idea. No, and, I don't. And, no, someone else in the media tipped me off at a station out there of what's going on, and that's why it's a form here. But San Francisco is under high scrutiny and might be getting taken over by the California State Police or some oh, other good. Now the LAPD will run it. That, that, then you'll see some beatings. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. By the way, is, is Mr. Some, I, I haven't heard his voice in about Yeah, minutes. No, Hello? he is gone. He's gone. Okay. Yeah, he, he stopped talking. That was it. Oh. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Thank you for calling, sir. Ben, if you're listening, call. It's your turn. Ben Cather's call in. We're weighing in on the war. And thank you. Uh, please, you know, stay with us. Um, what's your name again, Kristen, for yeah. calling in? This is great. Any, any other thoughts about the whole whole shooting match, as it were? Um, I don't know. What? I mean, obviously, it's Any not going to... questions, gonna, you can bring them at me. It's not going to stop before we end up getting Saddam. But here's my question. If, like, they're saying, well, bin Laden might be dead, we don't know where he is. What happens with Saddam? The other day, there, was so there were sources saying that they think Saddam there. might have died. They think he might have been... They think he might have died, and they definitely saw him going out on a stretcher. Now, whether it was him or one of his body doubles, what happens if... Iraq as a whole surrenders at the end of the war. Their brain trust right. comes in and surrenders. Right. Okay. How do we believe that Saddam is dead? We're going to want to see his body identified that it's him. We're going to want to see the little tattoo on his hand and everything else that they say that lets us know that it's him. We're going to want serious proof before we can believe that this is actually Saddam and not a body double. Well, but you know what? I was thinking about that, honestly. And yeah. then I realized at that point, it will not matter. Because we will have taken over the government. Right. So if you alive somewhere like Napoleon... Well, hang on, I'm going to chime in once more. Go. Saddam has something like $7 billion. He's on the Forbes list, isn't he? I, I well, think he so. Was. Yeah. Well, he lost a couple of real estate things. Are, uh, no, 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 no. Saddam and his immediate family have $7 billion yes. as a Mideast oil fortune, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where's that money now? You don't think he can't go in this? Um, hold on one well, second. America tied up to assets. That's Ben. Things, but yeah. yeah. I'm going to ask the caller. Caller, please hold on. Caller, please hold on. Yeah, please don't go away. Caller. Me? No, no, no. no the no, other no, no. The phone that was just ringing, I can't answer the phone and be on air at the same time. The owner, Ben, is calling. Ben, stay there. I okay. told him. Don't worry. Good. He's parked. Next problem. Saddam has tunnels. Underneath, underneath the ruins, underneath the city of Baghdad. Yeah. Those go all over out into the burbs. I think they said something like 30 miles worth of tunnels outside underneath the city. Yeah. So if you could go from theoretically Manhattan, what's 30 miles outside of Manhattan? Probably about Mineola, about Long Island. Here, yeah. All right. If you could go from Manhattan to about Mineola train station. Yeah. Just hiking underneath tunnels. And then come up in Min Mineola and just, you know, mix in with the crowd and go about and... Well, you're not going to be in power anymore. It's not a matter if you're in power. He's still got all that money. And influence. Some people still believe uh, him. He's got a high amount of influence. And you're looking at his brother-in-arms, who is one country over hiding, theoretically, in Afghanistan. Well, I mean, they're kind of enemies, but, yeah. Bin Laden and Saddam, yeah. I mean, you know. I mean, they're, they're not actually they, bosom buddies. But. Yeah. They were co-funding each other in certain ventures. That stands to say something financially, there's money changing hands being laundered or, or, or wherever okay. gray area that is. But, of course, if, if America ends up bombing so deeply into the ground that we, we disrupt, which I'm sure we already have, these tunnels... What if I mean, he already got out of the tunnels? He's halfway across the desert. With what? With what in his pocket? You can't carry $30 million in, in a, a knapsack. Yeah, but he has his people. He has his people in place. He's getting out of there. Yeah, he knows exactly. Underneath. They got past like you wouldn't believe. They got everything hooked up. Those tunnels. He's got, you know. He's 30 miles outside of the city. Everyone, everyone who's going to look for him is looking in the city. Mm. He's already gone. And probably out of the country. He's probably heading towards Afghanistan. Okay. In all theory. Because there were encampments on the border of Afghanistan, and that was on MSNBC. Are we still bombing Afghanistan, by the way? Are we still, still looking for o okay. OBL? That, that was my question. What happened? Did we just give up on him? No, it was like, no. No, no, he's no, on the rear, he's I mean, on the rear still, cooker. Our presence is still in Afghanistan. It's, it's, and they found, yeah. they found the our two of them because they were communicating on cell phones. 
Now, Bin Laden's smart. He buys a cell phone, uses it once, makes a call, hangs up, destroys it. There's no way to track that phone number, that electronic signature, or anything ever again. It's gone. It, it's very scary to think that this guy is just out there. We could never find him because he was hiding in caves. Yet With a cell phone. Yet intelligence was strong enough for us to know exactly where Saddam was on the first night of the war. And that's because he made a phone call with his cell phone. Really? Was that? But we that? can't find a guy that's hooked up to a dialysis machine, a dialysis. dragging a dialysis <laughs> machine through a desert, hiding in caves, and we can't find and, him. And, the guy, and he's sending videotapes to Al Jazeera television. So, you know, New t-shirt. Got batteries. No. Really, a dr guy dragging a dialysis machine, a couple of dozen sheep for food. I know, sustenance. really. Like, if you picture that, dragging a dialysis machine, not only that, but he brings the machine with him. Then you got to go back somewhere and, you know, get the dialysis machine taken care of every couple. I mean, you yeah, can't right. go this long without getting new equipment. You can't go to a well in Jordan and fill like, oh, <laughs> his right-hand man was and killed. And can't find this guy? His right hand man was killed and they just took his kidneys. They were like, sorry, <laughs> sacrifice. <laughs> if, or, or was this right hand Listen, man his, Jack at the time? His, yeah. his, right, <laughs> his right hand man was living through a life with no real food, wearing rags for clothing. They told him, listen, you're going to die. It's going to be a great task. And like the Koran says, you're going to get to heaven and get 41 versions. And the guy says, okay, take my kidneys. It sounds like a good deal to me. <laughs> I don't know. Can we go to break now and come back for the last yes. half of the show? Callers, please hold the line. I'm actually... Oh, you got to run. Go yeah, I figured that. Okay. I gotta uh, we get, didn't keep I got to catch uh, dinner with the fam. So, Thank you uh, so much. In, yeah. That was oh, impressive. No problem. I enjoyed it. Thanks for the help. Hope maybe we'll see you in studio next week. Yeah. Thanks a lot. No problem. Apparently there's plenty of people calling this week, probably because there's no staff in studio, so they're all at home calling in. Hello, callers. Hello, Rich. Hello, Mike. How you doing? Good. Hey, Mike Cagney. How you doing? Mike, real hey. quick, before we go back into war for a minute, how was your, uh, how's mock trial competition? Minnesota is great, Rich. Let me tell you, and I want everyone in New York to know that, uh, I just can't wait to come home because there are a lot of blind girls, and I just can't stand all these damn blind girls hitting on me. Is that blind or blonde? Blonde, blonde. Right, oh, they're okay. blind too, I guess. That would make a lot more sense. <laughs> he just smells good. Uh, <laughs> is Ben there too? What happened? Is Ben on the line? I Hello, Ben. Not. How you guys doing? Good. What's up, Ben? Not much. I just came back from a softball game with the uh, business school team. Yeah. Yeah, that's scary. Uh, we lost 16 to 1. Bunch mm -hmm. of Chinese kids with glasses. There's no wonder. <laughs> no, we only had one Asian kid. We thought he was going to be our good luck charm. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Sorry, I, got the only, I, got, I got the only run squid, though, so I was very excited. Rich, 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 I got a quick question. Who's in the studio right now? Just Rich and Dave and hey. producer Paul behind the glass. That's amazing. Uh, I was told to call on the radio show to stay the show again, and we're an hour behind over here, so it's really like uh, 6 o'clock. Yeah, there you go. Okay, I, I went he on can't the even get here on time when he's in the right time zone. <laughs> so the fact that he's calling in, I think, is a miracle. Yeah, it is. I, I did rapid fire by myself the first segment. Producer Paul started me off, and that was it. I was like, wow, we have nothing to talk about. We'll be <laughs> back if more techno. Wait a second. Who started you off? Just Producer Paul. He goes, this is rapid fire. It starts now. <laughs> oh, no, that is terrible. <laughs> and where were you? Where were you? Yeah. So how was listening? How was competition? You got Ben's here somewhere. Hello, Ben. Uh, hey, uh, hey, guys. Mike, are you guys winning, losing, getting killed? We just got spanked. We're done. You're out. We're done. Season's over. But you don't come home till Monday. Until tomorrow uh, right. afternoon. Th that's right. You couldn't get a quicker flight. No, we couldn't. Uh, Priceline. One, one more night of one more night of no curse you for Mike. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh no. So, so who's at a softball game and who's at a, at a, a debate Ben was game. at a softball game. Yeah, okay. And Mike was at glorified speech and debate in Minnesota. Cool. Well, how is Minnesota? I'm, I'm going there in a couple bears? weeks. Is it? Is it? Aside from the blonde girls, which is yeah, already very weird. Was very weird in Minnesota. They have a World Trade Center, and it's like a, a, a little building, but it's called the World Trade Center. It really disturbed me. So I'm at a hotel, but there's nothing around here. Oh yeah, you want to hear something even worse? Well, what would you build by a building called the World Trade Center? <laughs> Like, what, 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 what? In, um, I was in Chinatown in Boston yesterday, and they had the Chinatown World Trade Center, and that was really freaky. 
Well, it's, well, it's the World Trade Centers all are all over the place, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this was the Chinatown one. You know, the ceilings only have to be six feet in that building. So, <laughs> right. Even though it has 101 floors. <laughs> no, it was like... It's not really it's that like tall. And everything. I mean, you lock it down and you want to build it up an hour later again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Rich, yes. Rich, I just want to let you know that we went to the Mall of America, which is probably the main oh, tourist attraction. Oh, I've seen attraction. that. I've seen that, yes. Right, right. It's the main tourist attraction in Minnesota. Yeah. So we're at the Mall of America, and long story short, we took this little log ride got all soaking wet, we had to go buy new pants. And we're going to buy new pants, and we went into Hollister, and we found all these blonde-haired, blue-eyed people. There are no Italian people uh, in Minnesota. I've come to that conclusion. All right, I'm moving to Minnesota. <laughs> it's official. No meatballs, no spaghetti. No, it's all uh, bad pizza. The pizza, so I mean, the pizza put me on the toilet the whole night, man. Let me tell you, oh. terrible. Yeah, good Rich has been sick throughout this whole show. <laughs> <laughs> Dave can hear his stomach going crazy. Producer Paul, I have a little Italian techno on my CD, if you could cue that up for me. Um, anyway, boys, what are your thoughts on the war? Oh, I haven't heard techno in days. Thank you, Rich. That's your thought on the war. You haven't heard techno in what days. You, what are your thoughts on the war, boys? The thoughts on the war? Yeah. Yes. I really don't have many. Yeah, he uh, used them all up in debate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, I guess I could, I could comment on other stuff, but how many blonde people are up here, but the war, I, I, I really don't know. Well, this war is about saving blonde people, isn't it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what was that? Mike, can you hear that? <laughs> Wait, what is that? Oh, I hear That's my song. You ripped me off on that song. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mike's Italian techno song. <laughs> All right, so last question, we'll let Mike go and get Ben's thoughts on the war. Mike, so what place did you guys finish in? Like third to last. Third to last. St. John's well, national you champions debating? last year, third to last next year. What position would you take besides, you know, missionary? Oh, my God. Oh, boy. Mike, you didn't, win, you didn't win best witness or anything interesting? No, I didn't, but a couple of, like, esteemed colleagues from individual hardware home, and it's very exciting. Well, Any, let me tell anybody you I would know? Uh, no, no, nothing. Kirk, Kirk, Kirk's a stud. Kirk is now picking up a right. to come to awards. Thanks for, calling, thanks for calling, Mike. We're going to get Ben's opinion you're, on you're the war. You're cutting me off. You're cutting me off my own show. This is unbelievable. Okay, where are you? You're in Minnesota. <laughs> Say hi to the Parlor Bears. And we're going to have tons of people in studio next week. I guess I'll do this plug now. Next All week right. will be the biggest Teen America show in a while. We're going to have tons of people in studio. Big party. Lots of fun. No dead air. We promise. Um, and we'll have Mike and a couple of his friends there, correct? Bye, Mike. Mike's gone already? Oh, man. He's going to get me for that. Hello, Ben. How you guys doing? All right. What are your thoughts on a war? Well, it's like I go to a school that's incredibly apolitical, so I really, like, I, it's hard for me to get, like, hear both sides of it, if you know what I mean. Okay. okay. I mean, my school had a protest rally that had 15 kids in it, and, you know, I go to a school of 30,000 kids. What school is this? Boston University. Okay. Ben has classes with like 400 people in them. Yeah, my econ class is 650 kids. Oh my God. Can you, just what? like in a gymnasium, everyone just sits on the floor. How do you learn like that? Yeah. You, oh, you know, econ, you just, you go to the website and you download <laughs> the slides. I you, mean, seriously. You know ridiculous. what's interesting? Someone's always sneezing. With 650 people, <laughs> all you hear is... <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's in a auditorium of three. It's a three. It's a three-floor auditorium, and you just you know try to find a spot on the third floor. Wow. Does, it, does attendance take like the first forty-five minutes? <laughs> no, it's, no, it's no attendance. No attendance. So yeah. why bother? Why show up? How do they test you? Um, we have in in econ, we only have three tests all year. Okay. So what is it? it it's got to be done like online or like a paper or something. Oh, no, no, no. We took it. Like, you know, we, there's 25 TFs for that class, so they go around and do all that stuff. What? what uh, 25 what? TFs. Whatever that is. The teaching fellows. Okay. Like the graduates. So, like the graduates. Oh, so, so you teaching. can't just go into third level and just take the book out and put it on your desk? Right. You guys should try to take the test in it. Yeah, because they like watch you and such. That, that works in St. John's. You just take the book out and put it on your desk and the teachers don't care. <laughs> it's just like a gospel call. Let's get them and ask their opinion of the war. We fought. We for Jesus. Hello. Hello, caller. Uh, <laughs> oh, she's here. She's going to go. Hi, how are you doing? Is James Hodgson today? Uh, no, no. James is off fighting the war, actually. He's, uh, he's out in, uh, in Iraq at the moment. But he'll be back for his shift later tonight, I think about 2 a.m. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Bye -bye. <laughs> Oh, ben. Uh, hey guys, so um, it's like, for, so I mean, like, my thoughts were that I really feel that um, Saddam has to be taken out. But I feel that the way that they've approached it, and the way that Bush has handled this diplomatically, and the way of you know of like basically saying, okay, we're going to attack at this time, and then actually doing that, 
has been just all wrong. I think. They've, I, I mean, don't know. I think I mean, Bush I think Saddam should be pretty like, well. I think I think Saddam has been playing like a fool with the UN for the last you know couple of months. It's been twelve years. Yeah, I mean he's been really screwing him around. I mean you know you don't announce okay this is when I'm going to start the war and then you actually go and do that. I mean you know they no no done. no I think we actually started three minutes early. Yeah. <laughs> well no, actually kinda, no 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 if you watched on MSNBC um, on Friday I think it was what Thursday night I remember I was I was there. Um, they, they actually had a time counter where they actually had a clock where it was like five minutes left and they're like five minutes till war and it yeah. went like five minutes, four minutes, well, three minutes. I think week. it started at 9.31, I know it started. Right. Um, <laughs> so. I mean, I just feel the way that he's handled it has just been absolutely horrific and it's, he's looked like a fool to all these other countries. See, I have the same feeling. I think he's handling it well on TV with the speeches and everything, but I thought, too, that a sneak attack, like a big... Big blitzkrieg, let's just wipe the whole country out. The whole shock and awe campaign, right. Yeah, you don't just, say, okay, we're going to have a shock and awe campaign, and then, you know... Yeah. You, okay, kids, tomorrow we're going to have <laughs> stage three. Can right. you it's say like, stage tomo- three? It's like tomorrow, it's like, they're like, I know they're trying to help the people out, but they're like, tomorrow, he's like, tomorrow we're going to bomb this building, this building, and this building. If you don't want to die, Get out please of stay away from those buildings. <laughs> so then, you know, the Dom's men are like, okay, we'll just go put you <laughs> another underground bunker. He, he's trying to limit civilian casualties. Yeah, right. Yeah. Here, Saddam is arming his soldiers and he's putting them in civilian clothing. So you can't even kill these people until they point a gun I at think you. The thing, I think also well, that's that, what cops do. I think, oh, no. they, they went to the ground way too early. In the Gulf War, they had a ground war for exactly 100 hours. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I mean, understand here, that. Why? I, mean, yeah. I don't know why they don't just stick to the bo- massive bombing campaign because they have anti-aircraft, their anti-aircraft guns are very poor. They have no air force. They have no navy, so you can just sit at the carrier the whole time. First of all, they have no targeting system, so they first shoot up a flare so they can illuminate the sky. And see where they're going to shoot. Oh, <laughs> that's where I have to no aim. No targeting Whoops. system. They've got laser-guided missiles. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Saddam's country. Half of their targeting system is by launching up oh, a flare. Oh, yeah, I, I thought you meant our targeting system. No, so. our, our targeting system is very sophisticated. We right. can, yeah, but so why do we need ground troops? We can hit a guy's dinner plate inside right, I mean, his home. You gotta obviously need ground troops, but I mean, if you watched the news last night at 3 a.m., they actually had... Nope. Bo- you don't have a life, do you? <laughs> no, okay. 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 The, uh, the idea of the ground troops is so that we can isolate and Not, maintain yeah, I think the ground troops, yeah, the but you cities put them and in the areas early. that we take. No, 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 no. It's, bam, we own this city, you're not coming back. Should, but you should have seen city it, though. City after you, city after city. That's what they've been that's doing. That's what we're doing. If, you doing. Watched it on, if you watched the news last, okay, on 3 a.m. last night, I was just coming back home, and I just turned on the news, and I watched it, and they were doing a live battle. It was the Sky News reporter was on. It was like 4 p.m. in the afternoon in um, Iraq. And the guy was actually on the front line. Like they, they had a camera right next to one of the soldiers, and they were on the front line of a firefight. Yeah. And it was and like they, they, the ground troops invaded a place that was barely even bombed. They basically the only way they were able to win is once they called in the air force to blow to bomb them, and that's the only time they got secure. And I just feel that these, these ground troops are going in with you know all they're doing is saying, okay, we got people here, and then why waste you know, the fuel if the city's half abandoned? What do you say? Mm. Yeah, but it, so why waste the life? Good point. When you, why waste the life? When then? you watch the maps on TV, they literally have a shaded area, and it says coalition controlled, and it just slowly keeps creeping up the country. Right, but that's and, fine. But like when they're invading these areas where they haven't even been bombed yet, and they're just like they get. That's why we're having these set up. Sure, they've captured only 12 soldiers, but that's still 12 more soldiers than they should have ever captured. Yeah, I, I well, I agree on that point, but. Hi again, Dave Lefkowitz here, and you're listening to Dave's Gone By, a pre-recorded edition, and what you were just listening to was me on a different show that used to be on WGBB called Teen America. They uh, threw me on as kind of a guest back in mid-March, and so I thought I'd play a bit of that, and uh, although it was sort of still in the height of the war and some of the things we were talking about are, uh, are a little past their due date, I think the conversation was kind of fun and lively and... Uh, still germane. Anyway, speaking of politics and war and all that, I wanted to uh, do the rest of the show playing another segment of another show that I was on called Joe Salzone Live. In fact, that's one of the few shows still remaining on WGBB from the previous regime featuring Joe Salzone, who is a young fellow, I think he's still about 20, considers himself the youngest political 
talk me than out there on talk radio. And what's funny is, um, before his last birthday, he was extremely right-wing and conservative, as you'll hear on this tape. Since then, since he's gotten a year older, he's moving a little more to the center, um, criticizing, actually, the Bush administration now and again, which he never would have done just a few months ago. So anyway, uh, he was kind enough to let me appear on his show back on November 30th, 2002. Uh, so, so this is uh, quite a few months old. I'm, I'm interested to hear what it sounded like. And so it's a little less than half an hour long. I hope you enjoy it. Again, I will be back live next week on June 22nd. I hope you're enjoying this show. If you want to find out more about Dave's Gone By, you can email me at davesgoneby at aol.com. That's davesgoneby, no apostrophe, at aol.com. Or check the website, hometown.aol.com forward slash davesgoneby. Hometown.aol.com forward slash davesgoneby. If you forget that URL, just do a Google search and we're right up top. Anyway, here we are, going to a tape from November 30th, 2002, with me guesting on Joe Salzone Live. Live to homes all across Long Island, welcome to yet another edition of Joe Salzone Live on 1240 AM WGBB. It's good to have you with us coming to you this week from Studio A. Well, joining me in studio here, he's the host of Dave's Gone By, which can be heard Sunday night, 8 p.m., Right here on this very station, Dave Lefkowitz is his name, and he joins us right across from me. Dave, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Hope you're doing well, too. It's good to have you with us here. Now, you and I, we, we've debated a lot off the air and on the air as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of issues that we agree on and disagree on. And one issue that we seem to agree and disagree on is Iraq. I want to read you something. Okay. Uh, Gary Milho uh, Milholland wrote in the uh, Wall Street Journal last week a commentary that labeled Hans Blix, who's the chief UN weapons inspector, essentially an imbecile. Well, now, uh, well, if George Bush can be called a moron by the Canadian aide to the prime minister, <laughs> then I guess they can, the Blix can call this guy an imbecile. But well, he, he cites the fact that uh, Hans Blix has been involved with Iraq before. He's, uh, he's failed on numerous occasions. Uh, he is not seen as being an ally to America. He's seen as as serving his own self-interest and, and the interests of the UN, which is, in the, in the opinions of a lot of people, a grossly anti-American organization. Well, sure. And anti-Israel, of Yeah, and, and anti-Semitic. What are your thoughts? Well, are, were you going to read that, or are you going to... No, I'm just signing it. Oh, okay. Um, I'll read mm -hmm. you quotes quote if, if you want. Well, I did a, a joke, or, or there was a joke in the program, I think about a week ago, that the situation with Iraq is that if Iraq says, no, we have no weapons, America's going to attack them. If Iraq says, yes, we have weapons, America will attack them because we've got to go in and they're dangerous people with dangerous weapons. If Iraq lets UN inspectors in to look at their weapons, America will attack because we don't trust them and they're probably not showing where the, all their real weapons are. Right. So it's, it's really all, it's all a dance. It's a moot thing. We're going in. It's just a question of when and, and whether the UN is in cahoots with these people, I don't know. It probably won't matter. So it's a question of not if, but when uh, a war on Iraq will happen. It's been brewing since Bush took office. You know. But even before that, Bill Clinton himself had said in 98 that right after the inspectors were kicked out, that the only way that there will ever be peace in the Middle East is, is if uh, Saddam gets out and if we have to remove him. So I think Clinton and Bush were on the same page, but I think different motives were involved. Well, yeah, but at the same time, how many years ago were they saying the only way that Cuba's going to be safe is to get Castro out of there? And we've lived with him for, for however many years. Do you think a war can be averted? Uh, depends what you mean by a war. Uh, a, a, an all-out war, who, with the intention of which, the goal, would be either one, a regime change, or two, to disarm Iraq. Well, we, I don't think we're going to be able to disarm Iraq, at least from a terrorism viewpoint. If, if we fracture the government, then it'll just split into all these little coalition things that'll be attacking us in different ways anyway. Uh, I don't think we can avert some kind of conflict whether or not Iraq specifically provokes it. I think we want to be provoked 
into it, we're just waiting for the moment. We're waiting for some kind of smoking gun to just go in there and do what we want to do in the hopes that it will do the job, right. which, which we couldn't do 10 years ago. In the early 90s, uh, the UN Special Commission was, he uh, was headed by a man named Rolf Ikeus, who was... Oh, I know him well. <laughs> Thank you. Who, uh, in fact, I, I suffered from Rolf Ikeus for about three months before the doctors cleared that up, yeah. Could it clear it up? It's better now. Well, that's good. It still has a rash, but... But the, yeah. uh, the other Rolf Ikeus, the serious mm -hmm. one, yeah. uh, he was the man that the U.S. backed as the, our candidate for the chief UN weapons inspector, and... It's uh, according to uh, Gary Milholland in his, in his uh, Wall Street Journal editorial, Iraq's champions in the U.N. security camp, Russia and France, vetoed Mr. Ikeus as too aggressive. They put up Mr. Blix instead. After ineffectual opposition from the Clinton administration, Mr. Blix took over the present U.N. inspection organization in January of 2000. So, so what you're saying is that this guy I is not what I'm saying. That's what, that's, not, that's what Gary's saying. Right. So, but uh, what is your question then uh, regarding that? Oh, well, I, mean, well, I mean, what are your thoughts? If, if Hans Blix is ineffective, as Gary Milholland states, and he does, he is a former weapons inspector himself, then, you know, but, but, then whose side is Hans Blix on? So, uh, then why doesn't the United States send its own commissioner then and not even trust the UN? Say to we don't Mr. trust Amazon, the UN. Per, Bring, uh, here's, here are the people. Here's the team we want to send in. We don't trust uh, wholly the, the UN people, their, their team, Blix and them. We want to send these guys. Will you let us have them in there, take them everywhere, show them everything you've got? And if I were Saddam Hussein, I would say, well, sure, can I send people to America and look at all your weapons? Right. Which, I, you know, I don't know if he has uh, the cojones to say that. If Saddam Hussein, if it turns out he does not have any weapons of mass destruction, if... if, if you Bush know, won't believe him. That's the thing. We will go in anyway. So you and I, mean, you and I, we seem to agree, and I, I think I agree with this as well, that, ar that we are going to war. It will be Gulf War number two. But I think the results will be a lot different than in 1990 when we went, when we took Iraq, uh, excuse me, Iraq out of Kuwait, which the goal was to get Iraq out of Kuwait. The goal here, I think, is one of two things. The first being a regime change to completely remove Saddam Hussein and install a, a pro-American... A puppet, yeah. A puppet, exactly. A puppet, puppet who will let Halliburton and Harkins uh, put their oil pipelines into It's not about oil. Okay. It's not about... And, and the, the second option would be to disarm him like we, like we do. I mean, we, we damaged his weaponry with the Gulf War. You know, his forces are not as strong as they were in the early 90s. He does not have the same amount of weapons. Right, but we can probably keep doing that without going to all-out war. Just, you know... But that's what target we bombing, like uh, you know, like the missiles they're aiming at Israel at the moment. Is it well? It, is it fair to say then that the war in Iraq has already started? Good. Well, if it was started, it was started on September 11, 2001. I mean, right. that was a declaration of war. It okay. just wasn't a particular country. Let, let me. Let me. Uh, that it's interesting you bring that up because a lot of people do not see a connection between 9/11 and Iraq. When we know, we we uh, we have proof of this that some of the 9-11 hijackers were trained and stationed in Iraq, in Baghdad. Right, well, That's a pretty I'm big sure some of them there. Were, you, but you know what, I'm sure some of them were also trained in Saudi Arabia, I'm sure some were, were in Qatar, and I'm sure a few might have been trained in Florida. Uh, you know, we, we can't quite attack Florida, although we probably should when the mosquitoes are out <laughs> in full force. I, but to say that, is, is, I'm, I'm not sure what you're getting at with that particularly. I mean, the war started we had to find out who started the war. We're assuming it was Iraq. The, the, the Bush administration apparently doesn't want to assume that Saudi Arabia is involved too because they kind of want to be on our side maybe and be our friends. There was a reason why Iraq's friends preferred Mr. Blix, according to Gary in his Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed piece last week. He already had an, unsur uh, an unsurpassed record of failure in dealing with Saddam. From 81 to 97. Oh, George Bush Sr. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Well, well, hold on there. But before we continue with that, the, the reason George Bush Sr. got out of Iraq is because he followed the UN, uh, the, uh, the resolution, and which said, you're not, going to get, you're not going to remove Saddam from power, you're not going to kill him, and George Bush did just that. He, he got out as soon as we took Iraq out of Kuwait and backed up mm -hmm. and took our forces out of there. You know, hindsight, of course, is 2020, and maybe that wasn't such a good idea. You know, Saddam hasn't exactly followed those resolutions either. Apparently not, no. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll give you that. Maybe George Bush Sr. was 
you know, bowing to UN pressure, I, which I find rather odd. Right. And just, I, I, it's, to me, it's, again, the Bush is not really cleaning up business, getting into something, and in that case, being able at that point to get him, right. and they didn't. And now, I mean, uh, we are talking about this earlier, uh, this whole Bin Laden thing, if you remember right. after 9-11, Osama Bin Laden was public enemy number one, going to get this man. He's the evil, he's the target. We're going to find him and get him. In that is, that, that's still a goal. But, yeah, but, but it, the war is bigger than, than one man. It's bigger, but it's amazing how, how very quickly they said, eh, he's not really the issue. Well, you know what somewhere. I, you know. I, I wonder if, if, it was, if that was said out of anger, out of frustration, that something like 9-11 could have happened. Hmm. Uh, maybe it was, you know... Uh, but that, I, that is the other thing about um, any potential war with Iraq. And it could also happen, certainly, if there's no war. And, and they develop all these weapons. Right. That, that's the Catch-22... Uh, the Salem Charybdis that we're in. If there is a war, we will feel it in terrorism all over the world. Right. If there's not a war, just Israel will feel terrorism all over the world, and we'll get it now and then. You know, uh, this uh, on Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, there were three simultaneous attacks in the Mideast in Kenya, and one was fortunately, by, the, by an act of God, of God yeah. what was, was averted uh, because the missiles, I mean, just missed the plan by just, I mean, a hair. You get the feeling that guy's going to go back to his bosses, you know, the guy who fired that missile, and he's going to get his arms cut off. It's like, how could you miss? <laughs> Two million dollar ICBM, you're pointing an airplane. How could you miss? Let me ask you a question um, about 9-11, the day itself. All right. Uh, on the anniversary, all right, a day later, the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, George Bush, went in front of the U.N. and said, look, if you're not going to help us out here, if you're not going to support us, we're going to go into Iraq by ourselves or have some sort of coalition with England and, and, and some of our allies in that region of the world, and we're going to do it ourselves. So, you know, it, it, to hell with you, right. it'll be up to us. Well, it, I've changed that tone a little bit now. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think he, it, it, it's all about timing and context. I think I, I also told you before that had George Bush, a month or six weeks or two months after the initial 9-11 attacks, said, we're going in, we're going to attack um, Iraq. We're going to go and get Saddam and blow them all to hell. All of America would be, you know, waving flags, putting uh, flags on cars and beeping and going one. And if he had said, we're going to do it to Saudi Arabia, everybody would be waving flags. Any Arab country, we're going to go into Brooklyn and find a mosque and bomb it. There would be such anti-Arab hatred for some legitimate reason. It right. wouldn't even be logical. It would just be this visceral response. Like, Arabs attacked us, let's get Arabs. Right. But now a year passes, and what happens is people start to think, and people got safe again, and people got okay. So they figure, why is Bush going to Iraq? Now, why do you wait so long? Is, it, is there real provocation? Is he sure Iraq is responsible for 9-11? And if he's not, are we provoking a war really to go after nuclear weapons? Because a bunch of other countries have atomic and, I'm assuming, nuclear weapons. Or is it because they just didn't want us putting little oil fields in there and... and that's why the Bush administration, it's so important to them to get this particular country. Well, first of all, there is still an overwhelming number of Americans who want to see a war in Iraq. I mean, let, let me rephrase that. We don't want a war. I don't think anyone really wants a war, but we're left with no choice. The U.N. has failed. They don't follow through on the resolutions. The weapons inspectors, they're going to fail. I think Blix, I think Gary Milhoulton, in this in very intriguing Wall Street Journal piece, uh, says flat out that Hans Blix will be the re one of the reasons why the UN fails yet again. Right. If if we if we cannot trust the United Nations, if we can't trust our so-called allies, then are we going into this alone? And if so, can we succeed? Well, we're always at England. Yeah. You know. Right. <laughs> and maybe Australia. Um, and then it's like a backhanded way, Canada too. Even though I mean, they fired the guy, or, or the guy resigned. Right. Who, or woman, excuse me, who called Bush a moron. So obviously, they want to keep the United States in their good graces. So we'll have some Canadian Mounties, you know, waving their little pipes at, uh, at the planes going over Iraq. So we're not going to lose everybody. And Europe, Eastern Europe, Western, already despises them. We are so loathed right. around the world right now. Okay. 9 11 notwithstanding, that we lost them anyway. Right. All right, more with Dave Leftwood in just a moment. We'll talk a little bit about 9 11 coming up on Joe Sal's own live.
Welcome back. It's great to have you with us on a beautiful Saturday evening on Long Island. I'm Joe Salzone, and we continue now our conversation with the host of Dave's Gone By. He is Dave Lefkowitz. I almost yeah, got your name what? there for a second. Yeah, I know, I know. The teleprompter doesn't work all the time. And, and what time is it on uh, Sunday night? It's on Sunday night, 8 to 9 o'clock. Yes, I was getting to that. Okay. All right, I want to talk a little bit about 9-11. Uh, a year, uh, I'm actually well, 14 months after the day itself, uh, George W. Bush finally is going to uh, begin a, a, a non-partisan, quote-unquote, commission as to find out what exactly caused 9-11 and how we could be prevented, yeah. similar to the Warren Commission after the Kennedy assassination. Which did so well, yeah. D it did very well, didn't it? Um, Christopher Hitchens, in his nationally syndicated column, wrote, uh, Why is a proven man, excuse me, a proven liar and a wanted man in charge of a 9-11 investigation? He's speaking of uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger of the Nixon administration. There you have it there. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Mr. Hitchens right, uh, makes some very, very good arguments as to why, first of all, Henry Kissinger should be in jail, and two, why Bush is making a big mistake. And I want, I want to well, get, first of all, what, I want to know your take on this, because, I mean, as a fairly right-wing conservative Republican, but also Kissinger is from about two eras ago. Right. And I personally like to know the case against Kissinger, because I'm a little rusty on him. He's, He's just been a pundit for 20 years. I don't know how he suddenly stepped back into the international limelight. So please, let me know what Hitchens is saying and, and what your thoughts are about him and the case against him. Well, as, as Hitchens writes, and, and I, look, I agree with him. I'm not a fan of Henry Kissinger. I think he's a brilliant man. I think he's a good statesman. But his character is lacking of substance. Okay. Let, me, let me tell you this. Uh, at, let's, Watergate is the most obvious of, of, of <laughs> examples. Yeah. But there are so many others. Uh, we were, all right, uh... Well, people who have the thing against Kissinger, it's all about Vietnam. It isn't so much... Watergate, they pin on Nixon and all those people. Kissinger, they, they hold as kind of a war criminal for actions, you know, in Southeast Asia. Well, it, it says here, when in office, Henry Kissinger organized massive, de uh, massive deceptions of Congress and public opinion. The most notorious case concerned the secret bombing of Cambodia and La uh, Laos and the unleashing of unconstitutional me uh, methods by Nixon and Kissinger to repress dissent from this illegal and atrocious policy. Now keep in mind, Christopher Hitchens is a liberal. All right. Right. I'm a conservative, and I agree with him. Yeah. So we, he's making good. He's making some good points. Right. But I think the, the purpose of any politician, maybe it started heavily in the 1970s, but it's all spin. Right. It's, it's all keeping things secret and not letting people know until the last minute, and and booster boosting public opinion in a certain direction, whatever the actual total facts happen to be. So if Kissinger is guilty of that, he's just guilty of being a politician. Well, it, it, it's a little deeper than that. Um, Chris, uh, excuse me, I'm going to say Christopher Hitchens then. Sure. Uh, Henry Kissinger, in his second career as an, get this, as a falsifier, it says here, pretty strong words, Kissinger appropriated the records of his time at the State Department and took them on a truck to the Rockefeller family estate in New York. He has since been successfully sued for the return of much of this, pub, uh, this property but meanwhile, he produced for profit three volumes of memoirs that uh, purported to give a full account of his tenure. Which essentially, what, he, what, he, what he's accusing... He lied in his autobiography. What, he, what he's accusing is not only did he lie, but he stole uh, certain things from... certain documents from the Nixon era. Right. Are uh, they public documents? Or no. What, well... That they, they are classified, they are, they are not, you know... They, are purpose, they were purposely classified for the, for the very reason that they didn't want, even after, you know, posthumously, Nixon did not want the truth to be out. Well, so, and, well, hold, hold on, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm a little confused here. Were the documents classified, why were they initially classified? To keep them secret by it, whom? It, it, and then it, it, Kissinger stole them because he wanted to keep them further secret? I'm, I'm lost. Well, and, and, and I share in your confusion because this, kind, this does seem to be kind of, uh, not only contradictory, but well, a little confusing. What what uh, Hitchens is uh, excuse me what Hitchens is accusing Kissinger of is not only were those documents sealed for like I said the very purpose of never knowing what they were the public never knowing right apparently what what Kissinger did for I guess his own monetary benefit he was, opened them up and changed them around and no, well, no he, he published them. them right which I, I guess you know depending on what they are and and I I have not seen these I'm not too sure what they are but. 
it, it could, you know, it, it, it could uh, put in jeopardy our national security. Uh, would Kissinger do that? I don't know. I, um, I, I don't, honestly have enough facts to, to really comment about this, because it's still confusing me a little bit. It doesn't make quite a, a lot of sense that Kissinger would steal this kind of material just to make it public, even if there were a financial gain. I mean, he's the person who could make uh, six figures just doing speaking engagements. So what the purpose of all that was, unless he felt or who was keeping them classified in the first place? I, there's, there's just not enough information about this right. for me to really comment. Right. So uh, the bottom line of Christopher Hitchens' rights is that uh, Kissinger is not the right man, and, and he should be on trial for war crimes. Well, that, again, because of keeping Lau the bombing of Laos, what, what is your feeling on this, first of all? What is my feeling? Yeah, not Hitchens, you. I personally, uh, I, 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 don't, I try not to make a, a, an analysis without knowing all the information. With, with, when it comes to Kissinger, it's a tough call. It, it is a tough call. Um, I, I think, uh, first of all, I think all the information needs to be presented without jeopardizing anyone. It needs to be presented to the American people. Let us make the decision. And if it turns out that he did, he did something during the Nixon administration to something illegal, oh, oh, then, yeah. he, then he should be put on trial. Yeah, actually, I was, I was thinking more in terms of having Kissinger be the go-to man on this whole Iraq thing. Well, you know, I, I did say he is a good statesman. He's just lacking character. And you need character, I think, to be a great statesman. Like the Churchills of the world, uh, or like the Ronald Reagans, and the 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 Ronald Reagan, Reagan uh, great character. Yes. Okay. What makes you think that? It has. I have it written down here. <laughs> let's move on. Okay. <laughs> let's move on a little. Let's, let's lighten things up here. It's, you know, Ronald Reagan didn't even remember what a character was oh, in the last four that, years. That, all right. All right. But let's yeah. move on. You want to talk about what? what? I, I, you know, I can easily talk about your guy, Clinton. Well, I, I, I won't. my guy. He was yes, a good he is. president. That's no, all. he wasn't. Yeah, he was. He was a terrible president. He was a terrible president in the last couple of years because the Republicans te kept him tangled up with all this impeachment nonsense. I, I know. Because he slept with a girl. I, it's a vast right-wing conspiracy. I know all the Republicans are responsible for all the ills of the world. I know. No, I, no, they were I know that rhetoric for killing a year and a half of his presidency with wasted time and nonsense. Oh, he killed a year and a half of his own presidency. All right. All right, but that wasn't we're, what we're, we're going to We're about. going to move on. We, we have just a few moments together. Lizzie Grubman was released from a 60-day sentence after serving for 37 days mm -hmm. on Friday from prison after mowing down 16 uh, club goers in the Hamptons. What do you thought? Well, and, but nobody died, right? She, no one died. Well, there were no deaths. Even so, it was depraved and different to human life. It's kind of weird that they only gave her 60 days to begin with. Uh, and I don't remember, was she intoxicated or semi-intoxicated or just... Um, like, didn't care, because uh, that might make a difference, too. If she, or... Didn't care. It, it, it was a growth in difference of life. Well, what can I say? I mean, obviously, there are people in jail for smoking pot for four years because it was their first or third offense and didn't hurt a soul. Right. And here's this woman who hit people with her car um, and just tried to get away, and she got a month and a half in jail. Right. N nothing really to say about that. Of course it's silly. Of course it's wrong. Of course she should have been punished a bit more. I don't know what community service she has further to do, All but right. it should be some. All right, Dave Leftwood, thanks for coming down here uh, tonight. He's the host of Dave's Gone By, which you can hear, of course, every single Sunday night, yeah. 8 p.m. on GBB. <laughs> GBB 1240. Thank you for having me. No problem. Welcome back. Today has gone by on June 15, 2003. We were just listening to a segment recorded November 30th, 2002, when I was a guest on Joe Salzone Live. And you can hear Joe's show still on Saturday nights at 7.30. I'm not sure how much longer it will be on, but I think for at least a couple more weeks. So anyway, thank you, Joe Salzone. Thank you also to uh, Engineer Paul and the folks at Team America uh, for letting me be a guest on that show also a couple of months ago. Just want to remind you again that although this week's program is taped because I'm out of town, I should be back, God willing, live next week, June 22nd, Sundays at 8, with a brand new, brand spanking new episode of Dave's Gone By. Once again, to contact me or to find out more information about the show, all you got to do is email davesgoneby at aol.com or check out the web website 
hometown.aol.com forward slash Dave's Gone By. No apostrophe in that either. hometown.aol.com forward slash Dave's Gone By. It's a cool site. It has pictures. It has information about past shows. Also, if you want to buy cassettes of previous episodes of the show, if you want to join the Bystanders Club and really support the program, especially as we're moving into June and so many things are changing at the radio station, I don't know what the future of Dave's Gone By is going to be. Your help and your support it makes a difference. And uh, hopefully, even if the show doesn't continue on this radio station, there are other venues, there's also internet streaming, lots of stuff. Okay. I want to thank you all for listening this week. Tune in again next week, Sunday at 8. We're going to go out with our usual theme music. Thanks again, and have a very, very happy Father's Day. I want to say love to my dad. Happy birthday, Joyce, tomorrow. See you next week. Until then, don't miss your days going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz saying good night, good flight, and gone by. Thank you.